This is St Andrews, South Brisbane. Please turn to our passage, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 28 on page 1085 in the Church Bibles. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. There are different levels of hypocrisy. I think this rates as rank hypocrisy. They were oh so fastidious about ceremonial uncleanness. They didn't want to get their hands dirty. But in fact, their hands were already dripping with blood. It reminds me of a scene in the 1978 TV miniseries Holocaust. It's Christmas 1942, and Eric Dorf is singing O Little Town of Bethlehem with his family, accompanied by his wife playing the piano that had belonged to the Jewish Weiss family and had previously been played by Berta Weiss. But we know what Dorf had been up to in his role as an SS Sturmbannfuhrer. The Jewish leaders had instigated and presided over a rigged and illegal trial of Jesus. You can read about it in verses 19 to 24. But they consider that the only thing that would make them ceremonially unclean, unworthy to be in God's presence, is being in Pilate's palace. Are they blind to the wrongness of what they're up to? the moral defilement it involves? Do they think that the end justifies the means? The Jewish leaders, like Eric Dorf, maintained an outward appearance of piety while being deeply complicit in injustice. Are we guilty of the same, maintaining an outward show of religiosity while harboring sin? I invite you to examine yourself for areas of your life where you might be accused of hypocrisy. Are there ways in which we are outwardly religious or morally upright while ignoring deeper sins or injustices in our lives? We must be vigilant not to let our rituals and religious practices become a facade that hides our moral failures. We should seek to align our actions with the heart of God's commands, striving to live with integrity in all aspects of our lives. Verses 38 to 40. Pilate went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. There's safety in numbers. Have you ever found yourself thinking that? At times, I've had a reputation for sticking my neck out. But there have been other times when I've sought to keep my head down and melt into the crowd. What about the maxim, it's best to go with the flow? When it comes to moral issues, the world out there has made some significant U-turns during my lifetime, and there's a lot of pressure, not least from the media, to get with the programme. Or what about really big salvation issues? Card-carrying Christians are definitely in a minority. What about the rest of the people? Surely they'll be okay. There must be some get-out clause. 
I think we can sum up all of these thoughts in what the serpent said in Genesis 3. Did God really say? To which, of course, the true answer is yes, he did. Yes, he does. And yes, he means what he says. I've heard people talk about church synods as if they're a way that the Holy Spirit channels God's will to us. So long as you've got whatever majority is stipulated, that's how God's will is determined. This is only ever for the time being, of course, until the next vote, when we might find that God has changed his mind. Friends, there is no such safety in numbers. The crowd back then in Jerusalem got it wrong. They were guilty of an injustice. Quite possibly, otherwise good people got swept along in the moment. Everybody else was saying, Barabbas, best to fit in. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The way the Holy Spirit actually speaks to us is through God's infallible and unchanging word, the Bible. It's true that we're able to discern its meaning and application through coming together as a church, as we are right now. But anything we decide must always be derived from and subject to the truth the Bible conveys. It's above us, not us above it. I've come across a church that says about itself, we affirm the Bible in its entirety as God's word without error and fully reliable. We sit joyfully under the Bible's supreme authority in all matters of life and doctrine, as we encourage one another to live lives that are faithful to Jesus. I'm happy to say that for myself, and I hope that you can embrace these sentiments as well. Just as the crowd in Jerusalem chose Barabbas over Jesus, we too can find ourselves swayed by the majority, compromising our convictions. We must be vigilant in testing the messages and values prompted by the world against the unchanging truth of Scripture. Instead of seeking safety in numbers or going with the flow, we are called to stand firm in our faith, even when it means standing alone. Let us commit to being guided by God's word, allowing it to shape our decisions and actions so that we may discern and live out God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our passage is headed in the NIV, Jesus before Pilate, and Pilate is present throughout. He's outside at the beginning with the Jewish leaders. He's outside at the end addressing the crowd. But in between, verses 33 to 38a, Pilate is inside the palace, and it's just him and Jesus. This was Pilate's big opportunity. He could have made a name for himself, different from the one history has handed down to him. Pilate knows the truth of the matter. He can see it right from when the Jewish leaders have nothing to say when he asks, what charges are you bringing? Verse 29. Now, inside, Pilate has an opportunity to hear what Jesus has to say. Is he willing to listen, or will this be drowned out by what others are saying, the Jews, the chief priests? We may marvel at Pilate's inability to take advantage of his one-on-one with Jesus. How can he have been so deaf, so blind, so stupid? 
But isn't it the case that we can be equally so? Each of us can talk with Jesus, and Jesus longs to talk with us. But do you do so? Pilate had a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, but missed the truth. We have the same opportunity every day. Do you listen for what Jesus has to say to you? Pilate had the truth before him, but was swayed by external pressures, choosing expediency over righteousness. Similarly, we face pressures from society, media, and peers that can tempt us to compromise our faith. Commit to seeking God's truth in all situations through prayer and scripture. Stand firm in your convictions, even when doing so is difficult or unpopular. Remember that Jesus embodies the ultimate truth and let his teachings guide your decisions and actions. Who is in control? We might say Pilate. He could have exonerated Jesus, and we would think better of him for that. But instead, he takes the easy, the expedient way out. He gives in to pressure and hands Jesus over. The crowd has its moment, but it's made up of individuals, each being swayed by those around them. If you were to point the finger at anyone, he'd likely point at the people around him. Or the chief priests. Most likely, they'd probably hide behind the concept of doing their duty. Verse 32. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Verse 37. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Who is in control? I think the evidence points to the fact that Jesus is in control and what is occurring is part of God's salvation plan. Despite appearances, God's plan was unfolding through Jesus' trial and subsequent crucifixion. Pilate and the Jewish leaders seemed to be in control, but it was part of God's greater plan for salvation. Trust that God is in control of your life, even when circumstances seem chaotic or uncertain. Surrender your fears and decisions to God, knowing that his purposes are being fulfilled. Avoid taking the easy way out, and choose to act with integrity, knowing that God's will is sovereign and his truth is unchanging. Pilate enigmatically asks, what is truth? Verse 38. But he doesn't wait for an answer. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there. Jesus is saying, I am the place where truth is to be found. It's not so much a case of what I have done as who I am. Jesus says to us, can you hear what I'm saying? Can you see who I am? Or are you allowing yourself to be distracted, blinded, the truth drowned out by what surrounds you? Pilate's question, what is truth? is left unanswered in the text. But that truth is embodied in Jesus. Do you recognize Jesus as the ultimate truth in your life? Reflect on how Jesus' teachings and his identity as the Son of God shape your understanding of truth. Ensure that your beliefs and actions are anchored in the truth of who Jesus is. Like Pilate, we face moments of truth. Will we listen to Jesus and stand for truth, or will we be swayed by the crowd? Let us commit to being guided by God's word and standing firm in our faith, 
even when it means standing alone. This is what Bruce Milne, former minister of First Baptist Church in Vancouver, has to say about the passage. The choice that faced the mob in Jerusalem is still before our world. Whom will we follow? Whom will we make our king? Barabbas continues to represent an alluring alternative, the fulfilling of this worldly ambitions and dreams, the gratification of human lusts and hungers. Jesus still stands before us, also offering his way of truth, a knowledge of the Father which, beginning in the valley of confession and repentance, leads forward along the pathway of daily surrender to him as Lord. Though on the surface less attractive, that choice frees those who make it to serve him in the world. It carries them, at last, beyond the passing shadows of the earthly into the enduring order of the kingdom which will have no end. Who is our king? Jesus or Barabbas? The world still chooses. So must we. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts, seeking your truth and guidance in our lives. As we reflect on the trial of Jesus and the choices made by Pilate and the crowd, help us to recognize the areas where we may be guilty of hypocrisy and compromise. Grant us the courage to stand firm in our faith, even when it means standing alone, and to align our actions with your commands. Lord, we acknowledge that you are in control, even when circumstances seem chaotic or uncertain. Help us to trust in your greater plan and to act with integrity, choosing righteousness over expediency. May we always seek your truth through prayer and scripture, allowing your word to guide our decisions and actions. Empower us to live out our faith boldly and faithfully, proclaiming Jesus as our King and embodying his truth in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.